When we say war, we need to get out of this mindset of people wearing uniforms and, and killing other people and blood being shed and think more in terms of, well, biological warfare, economic warfare with COVID, information warfare with what's going on inside our own media. Today, I sit down with retired Brigadier General David Stilwell. From 2011 to 2013, he served as the defense attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and was appointed Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs in 2019. In the past, America was so big and strong that we could be basically a Nebraska alignment. It's not that way anymore. So we have to think more in terms of judo. You use your adversary's strength against them. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. General Dave Stilwell, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thanks, it's good to be here. Dave, under the Trump administration, you were the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. What exactly did you do? And actually, let's look into your you know, history of working in government as well to start. We'll start with how I got to that job. I was retired happily in Hawaii, uh, where I currently live. And uh, the opportunity to come back to D.C. to work came up. And they, I said, absolutely not. I'm never coming back. And then 14 months later, there I landed. So how I got there, my last job on active duty in the military in 2015 in the Pentagon was I was the advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs on the same portfolio. And so I was fairly comfortable with, you know, how diplomacy works because we worked a lot with State Department there. And then how I got there is uh, here I am wearing my uh, Beijing military attache corps tie. Uh, everybody who was in the attache group there uh, has this tie. I wear it intentionally for these events. Uh, and I spent two years in Beijing as defense attache. With a name like Stillwell, you can understand that um, the history goes way back. In 1973, I read Tuckman's book uh, as a kid on Stillwell and the American experience in China. And my career and my life pretty much has pointed, just very nicely you know, merged into these jobs that uh, got me to Beijing, to the Pentagon, and then to State Department. But you were also a fighter pilot. We gotta talk about that. Right. So I joined the Air Force in 1980 as a, as a Korean linguist and uh, as an enlisted uh, man. And then I went to the Air Force Academy from there. And I didn't really think about flying at all, but if you go to the Academy, you're expect, you expected to fly. So I went to pilot training and I did pretty well. And so I came out as a, a fighter pilot. So I started off in F-4s, the old Vietnam era aircraft, and then pretty quickly transitioned to the F-16. I did uh, uh, two tours in Korea. I did six years total in Japan in the F-16, uh, a bunch of assignments in the, in the US. And you know the most recent in, unprofessional intercepts against Australian and Canadian surveillance aircraft uh, mm -hmm. near China. Uh, allowed me a chance to you know, pontificate a little bit on what an intercept is supposed to look like. When I was in the Pentagon, we worked very closely with the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, to get them to stop doing this, explaining to them why you don't want to see a repeat of the collision we saw on 1 April 2001 near, near Hainan Island. And you know, wearing wings on your chest uh, gives you the credibility to actually tell them, explain to them, because none of them had that. Tell them why it's a bad idea. So yeah, so I flew a lot uh, and I did a lot of diplomacy in uniform and then beyond. Well, so why don't we start there? So tell me about these intercepts because they, they have, we have been publishing on them, of course, in the mm -hmm. Epoch Times quite a bit. Um, deeply problematic, obviously, but you're looking at this from a bit of a different angle too. Right. There is no reason to get any closer than 500 feet. The intercepts, uh, they serve one purpose. It's, it's called an air defense identification is the keyword zone. It's to identify an unidentified aircraft that is getting close to your t uh, territorial airspace. And this comes out of the Cold War when Russian bombers would come over the pole uh, into Canadian airspace and we didn't know if they were gonna actually penetrate and try to take, you know, were they actually attacking us or were they just testing us? And so to check that, you would actually go up and intercept these aircraft and then tell them that if you go any further, we are prepared to shoot you down. That's what intercepts are supposed to do. U.S. surveillance aircraft do not get anywhere near Chinese territorial airspace. Uh, it's 12 miles. And uh, they are out there in international airspace where everybody is authorized to fly. Uh, and then we have these events, these sporadic events, incidents of Chinese interceptors showing off and in some ways um, trying to annoy those uh, aircraft who have a lot of people on board for making a political statement. In the past, those intercepts have been, I think, for the most part, a breakdown in flight discipline, something we train our pilots on. We, you will maintain flight discipline. We think these are, like Ling Shui for sure, was a pilot named Wang Wei who was just showing off and, uh, because he could. But these last two were problematic because of the timing. They happened back to back. And therefore, you have to conclude that they were told to do this from the very top. 
when that happens, that's something we need to talk about. Well, so, so what, what are they doing? Well, generally just flying too damn close. Um, again, 500 feet, that's five fighter lengths. A fighter is about 50 feet long. That's five fighter lengths away from the other aircraft. That's a lot of room. But when you've got them so close that if the intercepted aircraft, the surveillance aircraft, they get so close to you that you can't turn. And so when you try to make your left turn to you know, change direction, you've got this fighter right there and you don't know if he's gonna get out of your way. So flying too close is one. They will do um, you know, air show antics over the top, and that's a very difficult maneuver to perform, this barrel roll. We've seen that, and the most recent one we saw with Australia was what they call thumping. It's when, here's the surveillance aircraft, when they'll pull out in front, and then at a distance that's so hard to judge, they will turn the aircraft in front of and create a closure problem, and in doing so, disturb the air. And they're making the fighter through this, they're making the surveillance aircraft fly through the disturbed air can cause structural damage uh, or worse. If he misjudges the distance, you've got collision potential. And then in this last case, when they're putting out expendables, in this case, chaff, you have, you're putting this junk down the, the engine of the airplane. Remember, these guys are operating in international airspace legally. They're doing nothing wrong. And yet we've got the PLA doing these things. Um, it's, it's unprofessional, it's unnecessary. Uh, and as we saw in 2001, it can cause enormous problems in terms of escalation. Yeah, but what, so what is it that they're trying to accomplish? I mean, it, you're, I think, in a, in, a, in a position to think about this, right? It's messaging. And, and I think they think that if they do that enough, then uh, crews won't want to fly these airplanes because of the risk of being hit and killed. You can't eject out of a uh, heavy aircraft, right, out of a surveillance aircraft. There's no escape option. A fighter, you, you pull the ejection handle and you go up the rails and you have a parachute. So if this guy crashes into you and... Again, in 2001, the P-3 crew did a good job of, of recovering the aircraft after they knocked the nose off it and you know, busted the engine. If they hit them hard enough, they're not going to survive that thing. So I think it's intimidation, and they, I think they think they can make a standoff more by doing that. But international airspace is international airspace, period. So those are the rules. Well, so the Bureau of East, East Asian and Pacific Affairs, you know, so... There's a lot, State Department's rather large organization. So mm. wh what is it that you were actually doing over there? We were uh, executing national policy um, and then where there were opportunities suggesting and um, in many ways developing national policy on uh, the, the region, obviously. So we spent a lot of time talking about China. My background in China was helpful in that regard. But again, I've got time in Korea. I've got time in Japan. My replacement, Dan Crittenbrake, has a lot of time in, in the region as well. So he's a very good fit. Uh, he came out of Amb uh, Hanoi as the ambassador, which is really fortuitous, I think, because I think we need to put a lot more effort into Southeast Asia. And I think Dan would agree with that, that uh, Southeast Asia, 650 million people, uh, is the future. And we have, you know, our business, American business is doing great work in Southeast Asia. When we show up, an American business like Hewlett Packard shows up in, in uh, Malaysia where we saw them. They train Malaysians to work in the Hewlett Packard area. And then they send them back to the U.S. for further training. They sponsor them for college degrees, Starbucks. You can do um, your college with Starbucks in Vietnam, for instance. This is what American business brings. It's, it's, it's the, our basic diplomacy is our American businesses, and then, of course, the diplomats follow. So I really would like to spend a lot more time in, in cultivating our relationship uh, and our connections in Southeast Asia.